I'm Caitlin Berry. I'm the director of the Cody Gallery at Marymount University. And we are so excited to have all of you join us today for a conversation and sort of virtual gallery tour with artist Greg Kahn and Laura Lopez Duarte, who is an art historian in Madrid, Spain. And we're so excited to have Dr. Becerra, the president of the university, join us today. Thank you so much. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, the first is that we will not be using the hand raise function in the chat today. So please put all of your questions into the chat and we will try to get to them in real time um, and we'll field them to Greg and Laura as they come up. The other is please keep yourself muted for the duration of the talk um, and I will use the chat to share resources for links to the exhibition and um, Greg's website and his book that accompanies the exhibition. Havana Youth, um, which can be purchased on Yaffe Press. So I will share all of these resources as well. Um, without further ado, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on Greg Kahn, who's with us broadcasting live from the gallery today. Um, Greg is an American documentary fine art photographer. He grew up in a small coastal town in Rhode Island, um, and his, his work primarily concentrates on issues that shape personal and cultural identities. Um, he was a finalist for the feature photography, um, for a Pulitzer Prize finalist for feature photography with his 2011 project. Um, it's not a house, it's a home. So the, the exhibition that we have in the gallery today is called Havana Youth. And I'd love um, to ask Greg to begin by telling us how the project came to be and, and why you, you are documenting uh, Havana youth culture. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, this was something that I had uh, begun shortly after leaving a newspaper in Florida. Um, I wanted to go back. I wanted to go to Cuba. Um, there was so much interest in that area when I worked at the paper in Florida, but I never had the opportunity to go. So once I went freelance, it was the first trip that I booked. Um, I thought I was going to go down there and cover some of the same things that had been covered already, the, the relaxing of regulations, the opening up of being able to sell property, uh, sell a car, you know, open up a store on the bottom floor of your house, things like that. And, you know, the first couple of times that I went, it worked out about as well as it could have regarding the subject matter, but there was something that I was missing and I knew there was something I was missing. And it took a third trip down there to where I was I was having dinner at my fixer's house and I heard this like loud thumping from a bass coming through the walls. It was just permeating the entire building. And I didn't know what that was. I knew it was music. I didn't know where it was coming from. So I just thought, well, hey, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful night. Let's go out and explore. And stumbled across in one of the plazas in uh, Vidado was an electronic dance party out just in the middle. Uh, and it was just, hundreds and hundreds of youth dancing, partying, and it was, it was uh, current music, it was current pop, current electronica, and I just realized like how misguided I had been in, in searching for the story, and what I was really missing out on was this youth population kind of redefining and changing Cuba to be on their own terms. And so that kind of launched the project. I, I applied for a grant with Visco and I was able, fortunate enough to have four separate trips that were two weeks apiece um, that I could really go and start to meet uh, other Cubans and, and hear their story and start to kind of piece this together and to what eventually became Havana Youth. And uh, Laura is one of the uh, Cubans that I met early on and um, that I, you know, think of as one of my really good friends from Cuba. And, and I know she now lives in Madrid, um, but I just, it was so nice to have these conversations with Laura. We would go to a restaurant, we would sit down, we would talk over, you know, a, you know beers and food and just, just kind of talk about what everything that was happening going on there was and, and her perceptions of everything and, and how she felt about the changing culture in Cuba. And I just found it such uh, an invaluable experience that I thought for this artist talk, it would be great to just 
have that conversation with Laura as well. So Laura, welcome. Um, so excited. It's yes. been it's been a minute since we've had you. Uh, we've been able to actually talk face to face, but yeah. it's really great to see you. Um, can you just, you know, in the book, I talk about it and you actually write one of the essays for the book. Yeah. But what I thought was fascinating was kind of like that beginning story that you had, which struck me was was before you were even born, right? Like you were born in the height of the special period where resources were lacking. So can you tell us just kind of a little bit background of what that's like? Yeah, I think something very definitive about my generation and um, just thinking about, I, I, I hate to say, I hate to be a, a voice uh, of my generation. I think I'm just a, a voice of a generation. That's a very, yeah. but definitely something that has marked my generation has been the fact that um, we were born in a very, very specific circumstances. And that was the, the special period for me and well, for my peers and everyone that went to school with me and all my friends actually were born in the same, uh, in the same moment. So the special period for Cuba was a moment right after the Soviet Union collapsed. Before that moment, um, Cuba depended, I want to say depended almost completely economically um, on, on the Soviet Union. And uh, well, when it collapsed, we were kind of stranded in, in the sea. We had nothing to hold on to. And there was this crazy, the most crazy crisis ever. So there was literally nothing in Cuba, like no food, um, no gas. People, people were moving around in bicycles because there was literally nothing, no, nothing to put on the, on the cars. Everyone was crazy skinny. My, I, I, I always tell the story, the story, I think it's very, it's, I, I, it's very like impactful and I think it tells a lot about the moment I was born both my parents are doctors and um, uh, my mom says that when she was pregnant with me she always had this cra craving for like sweet things like a sweet tooth mm -hmm. and um, she says that the only thing she had to eat uh, to like uh, sweet thing she had to eat was uh, water with sugar. So I was basically, uh, you know, made du during my, the gestation period on water with sugar. So it was hard. There were no cats in the streets because people were eating them. Uh, I mean, it was it was a very very hard time. It was also a moment where a lot of people were um, leaving the country uh, like crazy because they could not tolerate the circumstances. But we kind of got through it, I guess. That special period. Yeah. So I think that's that's super interesting because I think that do you have early memories of what it was like when you were when you were young during this special period? Does it No, not at all. I don't have memories. I, I see photos. My it was like my house and in general there was just poverty, like nothing. Like not my mom says that in my house there was nowhere to sit at when you came in. You know, everything was just destroyed. And when you see other people's pictures, it was you know, it was bad. It was bad. Uh, fortunately for me, my mom says I never like went without eating, but in many cases that was that was the case. It wasn't my case, but but yeah, definitely. So so when did now your parents ended up leaving Cuba for a for a time, and yes. they worked in South Africa, correct? Yeah. yeah. So what? When was that? How old were you when that happened? So um, I moved. My, my parents first went to work in South Africa when I was two and a half. They left me behind, um, kind of not. But the thing is that we they had nothing. So it was like either you know have something and leave this kid for a year or just have nothing. So they left without me, and then they came back and they uh, they wanted my dad because he had a very um, wide tra trajectory in Cuban um, healthcare system. They wanted him specifically to go back and he negotiated with the people and were like, the only way I'm going back is if I'm taking my kid with me. So I was six when I moved to South Africa and I lived there for five years. So it was my formative years. It was, you know, as a, as a child, that was my, my childhood. The, well, the part I remember of my childhood was in South Africa. I see. So yeah. coming back, what is that perspective that you had coming back to Cuba? Now that you had been to South Africa, you had seen a, a different place, you had seen a different system of governance. What, yeah. is that, what is that like coming back to Cuba at that time? So I was a child. Um, my interests were very basic. For me personally, it was, um, so there's no, Fanta to drink or there's no Smarties or you know like 
things that I want are toys. And, and then we had to like start cutting up on, on, th on toys and things that interested me. So I didn't, I didn't ha acknowledge what was happening on a, on a personal, like political, economic level up until maybe recently, maybe like after I was 18 that I, I was like, stop. This experience I had is very weird, this juxtaposition of systems, and then that system over there has a very specific circumstances, I mean, just racially speaking, and I went through very weird things that I did not know was happening to me when I lived there. I mean, I, Talk I didn't- Talk more about that. Can, can you go into detail about that? Yeah, whoa, because my, both my parents are doctors, so my dad is black and my mom is, is white. Um, and um, my mom says that she had a very hard time because um, her co-workers that would be white uh, would treat her differently like she she per personally never felt she would fit in and then in the first school I was in because I, I, I didn't know English they put me in like a lower class school and uh, it's this is a funny story so the logo of the school was a white kid and a black kid holding hands and uh, there were no white kids zero white, only black. And I was the whitest person there, but they didn't understand what was going on with me. Like they would um, pull my hair or, or touch my skin. Like, what are you? What, what? So I would get in a lot of fights. This is me, first grade me. It was a horrible first grade. Wow. Like they did not understand what was going on with me. What, what was the problem? I remember um, it was late in the course. Um, uh, uh, this whiter girl came in and I went home and told my dad, my parents like, this a girl that is more white than me and I feel, I feel so comfortable now and she was albino so wow. yeah <laughs> so wow. then they, they took me out of that school because I was I was growing up to be a very problematic child and they put me in a different school with with um, a lot of culture cultures so it was uh, it was better for me there I didn't have the, those kind of problems so yeah wow. yeah and also my parents oh, my parents were, there was a lot of AIDS and they were in a public hospital working. And um, my parents both got um, like pinched with needles that had AIDS. So that, th those are things I didn't know um, happened, but um, they had to fight with that during a, to take the pills, the medication to kind of take that out of their system to not get the, so yeah, those things happened. I was a child did not know about that, but now it's like, oh, that was really something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, that's that's yeah. and that's that's so fascinating. I think yeah. one thing I want to talk about is oh, is there a question? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, but I was just going to comment, Laura, that you know these juxtapositions and um, questions about your own identity come into play at a very young age. Yeah, um, yeah which, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I understand that now. At, at that time, nothing. It was. Right. I didn't have these conflicts, really. Yes. I, was, I wasn't aware of those conflicts. So. Yeah. What, so, so take me through a little bit more than kind of through that childhood into your teenage years and kind of, you said you didn't really have that perception of the government and all the things that were happening with, with more clarity until you were a little bit older. Yeah. What was there something, was it an event that sparked it? Was it just, you know, through institutions of learning? Was it, uh, what, what, what kind of, kind of no, lifted the, the curtain? Thing is, I, I think in comparison to many of my friends, um, my, my, my parents were very politically active. I mean, are both, both openly communist. My dad is actually 86 now, which means that he, he fought for the revolution aside all of these leaders that we still have today. Um, so he is very, very, very passionate man, a very communist man, like Che Guevara is, you know, his idol. Um, so I grew up um, with that. And he, like, he, my, my mom is a little bit more apolitical, but my dad is, is very passionate about that. So I grew up, my dad was always like, this is the right way. I actually won history contests because I was super into history because of my dad. Um, like. I was very, very involved with learning about Jose Marti and, you know, very, very active, like knowledge and history was very in interesting to me at the time. And it was because of my dad. 
Um, and when I was, you know, when you leave, I don't know if this has happened to you because it's happening to me a lot right now. When you leave the place you're from, that only strengthens your sense of identity. Like right now, I'm 10 times more Cuban than I used to be when I was in Cuba, right? And it, it, the same thing happened when I was in South Africa. So there was this community and um, like we were all like super Cuban and we were all celebrating like the 26th of July. It was very, you know, very, very pro-government, right? So um, it wasn't when I, I, in my teenage years is when everything started to shift. I would say, I, I got, I had, I ha my dad says I was a, a teenager from Emmanuel, Emmanuel, like a classic teenager, rebellious, like, oh my God, I, I, I think about myself, I was such a hard teenager. So I started questioning things and I started being very angry. And then I started like consuming, because I knew English, I felt so much more identified with um, other movements. Like, wow, what's punk? And what's, you know, what's, what's this and what's that, what's hardcore? So I became very rebellious. And then I started like, um, let's say like dig digesting a lot of other cultures at the time, which meant me questioning what was going on in Cuba. Like, I don't think this is fair. So I, I mean, again, I am, my position is my relationship with, with the government is very weird. I'm not like, oh, I want Fidel Castro to die. No. Because again, I, I have I have had let's say a comfortable, a comfortable upbringing, right? And I've, my family has never had problems with uh, the government. On the contrary, it's like they are like those classic communist Cubans, right? That that have never stolen to get by, that have never done anything illegal. They're like perfect citizens in Che Guevara's <laughs> eyes. So um, it was, as I say, as I got older, that I started questioning things. Still, um, I'm, my position towards the government today is that I understand what's right, I understand what's wrong. Um, um, I don't want, like many people, I don't want to go to Cuba and, fuck, and you know, just lit the country on fire and, and kill everyone and you know, kill the government. I don't know what, there are people that are very, very angry. That is not my position because uh, because of my circumstances. So, so in, in that, there's, there's uh, talking about your generation. I think there's a lot of that, that feeling. There is, there's the understanding of things that were not okay, but there isn't this, there's still this passion and pride in Cuba, which yeah. is, the the filtering that sometimes comes out because the people who the people from Cuba who are here can sometimes be classified as only one thing and that yes. is seen as that's that's the entirety of Cuba and so I think it's really interesting because there is there's an in between it's not there's a lot it's of not there. full spite it's not I want to just go to America because America's the best there's there's a kind of this this push and pull that happens and i think that's that's part of it and the part that i really focused on with this work was kind of that rising sense of individuality which is something that you're kind of alluding to because you know when we talk about historical cuba there was this movement to be part of the collective part of the yeah. larger you know you you as a person didn't matter it was all for the greater good of cuba and so can you talk about kind of this from what I, from my perspective, there's this rise of individuality happening, still happening in Cuba, where people are, you know, I, you, you know, Miguel, you know, he's, he yeah. talks about fashion as being a way of people expressing themselves and how that was just one thing that changed. What are some other things that you might have seen, whether it was internet or, or other things that allowed people to explore that or evolve no. that individuality? There's right now, today, this explosion in Cuba of individuality and even more so than what was happening three or four years ago because only two years ago, I think it was 2018, um, everyone all of a sudden had, could have the possibility of have internet on their phones, which means right. that what was going on in the world um, uh, maybe in 2012 with, with Instagram is happening in Cuba, like right now, like we are now being exposed to like Instagrammers and, you know, people creating their own, their own identities and creating their own values in that sense, like in that digital 
era. Um, and talking about what you were saying about, um, you know, just this collective and individuality, that was something I always struggled with, mo uh, mostly in my teenage years. I, I still struggle with it today because I've never, I, um, I, I've never felt, uh, I've never wanted to be part of a collective. And um, since you're in school, that's something that they really push on you to just stay the same, be the same, like the same things apparent. But and then when you're when you're different, it's 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 kind of hard. It's uh, and I I I my my special um, like experiences is that I tr I tried to be different. Like I wanted to like you know. Um, so, um, my, my relationship with people in Cuba in general uh, is very weird in that sense because, because w while I was in Cuba, my position was, yeah, I don't like salsa. I don't dance salsa. I have absolutely nothing to, to do with you people. I'm, I'm into other things, right? But again, uh, that's a sense of identity that while I was in Cuba, my, my identity was, you know, in contrast. And now that I am outside of Cuba, I feel a lot more that Cuban identity. You know, it's, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm explaining myself right, but um, I feel now that I'm here a lot more like a part of a collective than I did when I was, when I was there. So yeah, um, absolutely. There's this rise of individuality now more so than three, four years ago. There's, um, I was talking with my girlfriend about this interview and I, I was like, you know, I, I, in Cuba, I always feel, felt like I didn't belong, like that I, I, my interests did not align with other people's interests. And she was like, and, and, and I told her, I don't feel like I am the image of my generation. And she was like, dude, there's so many people. There's so many people in your, like in the parties you were going to, you know, in the electronic, um, you know, EDM parties and in that scene, in the artsy scene that felt exactly the same way as you. So if you think about it, it's, it is kind of generational. I mean, it's, there were 300, 400, 500, a thousand people that actually do align, even though you felt so, you know, atypical, not really. You, what, what you want and how you felt um, actually, uh, were were being is being shared by a lot of people that in that same way feel and and think about individuality the the same way I do and that want to like be different and la 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 so yeah it's yeah it's yeah better. Laura I've Oops. actually got a question for you um, okay. as um, when Greg completed his project um, what were there things that came to light through his, you know, depictions of Cuban youth that were surprising to you, or that you may have been proud of as as you looked at the body of work. Um, really, I, I think he was um, he was just putting a finger on something that already existed, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I feel like it, it wasn't it wasn't like enlightening to me like I, I didn't find anything new I was just happy that someone was just looking at that space I remember what was the term I think was tossed around like I, I don't know if it was Greg who, who used it or someone else said it, it was something like the new Cuban aristocracy was that you Greg? Uh, huh. Yeah 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 we talked yeah, about that. That, <laughs> that. that idea that concept because the thing is that a lot of people think that um, just in Cuba it's just a bunch of you know, that, that people are just poor but there's in my generation there's just a blast of a lot of people that are, ha are having very high standards like like i would go to parties with like the uh with the castro family and like his his granddaughters would be on full chanel like you know so the, and, and like you would scroll their instagram it's just like yachts okay so there are people, it's not, it's no longer like a collective, a mass where everyone more or less has the same because that was the situation in Cuba back in the eighties. My mom says everyone more or less had the same thing right now. It's getting like hierarchy. Like it, there's a lot of difference, it, differences. Wealth disparity, even more, yeah. Yeah. Disparity, even more than when I was like in, in the secondary school, middle school, for example, like the kids that are in middle, middle school now, when they come back to class, they're like, where did you travel on your, did you go to Paris or Rome or whatever in your, wow. in your summer? And that never happened. Like in my school, nobody went to Paris. 
you know, in the mm -hmm. summer when I was in middle school. So things are definitely changing a lot. And I am, I'm glad that people are, are kind of throwing away that, that classic traditional image that there is of Cuba. And, and someone is pointing out that it's a lot more complex. It has a lot more layers than people assume. Uh, and yeah, I think that that was enlightening and I'm yes. very glad that was shown. Yeah. Yeah, I think we talked about it too. We, we talked about this kind of fishbowl attitude for, for tourists coming in where, you know, they would come in and you'd, you'd hear the thing, especially around here, that they wanted, somebody wanted to visit before there was a McDonald's or Starbucks on every corner. Oh, and yeah. yeah. I, worked, I was a tour guide for three years, only worked with Americans in the US. So yeah, I heard that every week and I was like, well, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's, that's the problem, right, is, is like, there was, there, there's significant infrastructure issues. Yeah. And this idea that, that an American would come in and, and say something like, well, I hope I get here to see all the, the crumbling buildings before there's a Starbucks, is kind of like, well, there's people who live here, and there's, you know, you, this, is, this is otherizing Cubans. And I, I think a lot of this project was to kind of take that away, like, not show the classic cars, not show crumbling buildings, like the, the stereotypical things that you see, because it seems like a lot of people would come to Havana and just concentrate in old Havana yeah. and a lot of the touristy kind of things there. And so the flood of imagery that would reach us would be from there. And so I think one of the great things about Instagram now, and you can probably speak to this too, is that all the Cuban photographers who didn't have platforms that would reach you know, us now are, you know, I'm connected with so many Cuban photographers who are showing all kinds of amazing stuff there that is, you know, it, it's empowering so many more voices that can, you know, come be in the U.S. and, and create that kind of um, individual narrative that they want to talk about. So there's this really great thing that's happening, but I remember talking with you kind of about that, that stigma, and that's what I really wanted to kind of get away from with the work because I felt, I felt it there. And I felt like when I talked to so many people like you, that that was, it was, it was just so frustrating because you didn't feel like your generation was being heard. It was kind of more following along the old narratives. Exactly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, so, inside. yeah. So one other thing I wanted to kind of talk about was where do you see Cuba going? I mean, where do you, like, you know it's changing right now, and my uh, uh, kind of a basic premise that I had for this was that this moment was a starting moment that, you know, decades from now, people will look back on and say, this is, this is the moment that Cuba changed, and things happen so slowly, and it's so nuanced, and there have been so many false starts that you can, you can be fooled in thinking that it's not happening this time either, but my, my perception is, is that you know, now all this stuff that is out, the internet, the connectivity, the p people traveling again, I don't think you can put that back away again. I think this is, we'll look back and say that was the moment it kind of started to shift. But what happens when you and others get to the age where, you know, they're starting to become the government, starting to be the leaders that aren't the leaders of tomorrow, but are the leaders now? Where do you see, what do you see Cuba becoming in that moment? Um, so I, 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 I don't really have an idea of what will happen with Cuba if things, um, how, how much things will say, and I, I, I'm referring to politically specifically, like how much, um, how much time um, this whole system, if it will change and what, I mean, I, I honestly don't know. Um, the, the thing is for me right now is that while I was in Cuba and um, my perspective um, if you would, you would have asked me the, the same question a year ago, would have been different to what, what I'll answer today, because they're completely different perspective of the same reality from Cuba and from outside of Cuba. Um, right now, I'm, I'm looking, seeing like, when I go to Facebook or whatever, I see a, a very active, a very solid like I don't want I want to say like independent like independent jour journalism and independent actions that are protesting and are asking for actual change and it has been because of social media so social media has definitely given a lot of people a voice and something that's interesting is that the government ha is the government is using social media to track people that are 
thinking differently and that are saying things, for example, this, this um, um, thing, this, this uh, law that they wanted, they implemented a uh, 349 for culture that basically um, this, this um, conversation surrounding 349 started about two years ago. And a lot of artists were like, no, um, we, we don't want that. It basically because it, it took away um, freedom of speech for many artists. And that was something that artists were like, we don't want that. So uh, for example, in Cuba, many of the people that are being taken to interrogation for whatever reason, and um, they're being told things like, why did you put on Facebook um, a post about no to the 349? Like they now, like when they, when they um, like want to inter do an intervention, like a political intervention to someone, like what you put on Facebook is a card that they are, you know, taking into account. What, what kind of people you're hanging out with through because of Facebook. So what I'm seeing now is that it's, something it's very the political movement is very effervescent like there's a lot of people that are are really fighting and being very um vocal about the things that they want and it could be i mean it could be politically culturally but it could be like um i have a lot of friends that are fighting for um a law against the violence of uh, um, against women violence and and for girls because there's a lot of um um what in cuba what we call passion crimes which is a horrible way to say uh, in Spanish is feminicidios like the women that are uh, being killed and that is not being talked about and that, but but uh, so social media is giving all of these causes a voice and a lot of people are regrouping and are talking about things that are super super important um, so definitely there's no going back from this point and I'm very proud of that I'm, I, it, it it has been very hard in Cuba to just have a voice and to be heard and to be very firm about the changes that you want and what and I'm seeing that a lot. People are being very active right now, mostly from outside of Cuba, <laughs> some from inside, but there's, you can see how it's a lot more compact now. So um, I would say that uh, my generation, when my generation comes to power, um, I, what I, told, I said earlier that I feel like my generation um, is fragmented, um, that it, uh, most people are not like me, um and do not think like me and there's also a lot of hypocrisy i have, I have, I have friends that are very very um like that work for the grandma newspaper like the newspaper for the communist party and those same friends like they're all like journalists they're like like super square-minded very nice people super square-minded and they're around my age and those people like literally i was talking to one of them two days ago and she was like um, oh, take me to Madrid, get me out of here, you know? So it's, it's like, yes, we support this. It's, it's, and I think they support it because they don't question things. It's almost in their DNA. It's almost something that has been like put inside them so hard that it's just very hard to question. So I think there are a lot of young people my age in Cuba that will carry um, the the ideologic system that has been imposed to us. Um, so I think there's a possibility that in 40 years or 30 years, yeah, it, um, it, 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 could, it could carry on the same way. But yet, remember, and, and this, I think it's still happening with like our president today, there's so much hypocrisy because that president um, is the same age as my mom. And my mom went through the special period and you know, which made her question things. And that guy I know must have questioned things, but still, he, it's, it's this sense almost of homeland of pride that we're like, you know, that has been put on us that is so strong. And, uh, I, I, and I don't think, I mean, I feel, I, I, I feel it also, but it's just being very square minded, you know, just, just people that don't question stuff. And that's why I think it could carry on for many years, but, in the outskirts, there are a lot of people that are like bombing with information and of course, so, through social media, like this is wrong, this is what's going on in the world. Like um, after the George Floyd incident, oh, well, incident, horrible um, um, thing happened in, in the US, actually there was this video running around in Cuba that happened like a week after of a, a, a black man that was shot in 
in the back and then social media went like crazy. Also, I think because they wanted to emulate more or less because um, uh, um, racially speaking, I mean, what's the, the systemic racial problems that you have in the US are not the same that we have in Cuba. Still, it's, we, there's a lot of racism, it's just different different races and like, and you have to uh, understand because of the history and so on, so on, so on. But um, it still, there were people that were, that were outraged and that were, you know, like, uh, like asking for justice and for change through social media. So I think, yeah, that's something we will not walk away from. That's something that will only grow. And I'm very excited. I don't know where it's going though, but I'm very excited to see it grow. Wow. Well, just kind of jumping on the, on the end of that, you're in Madrid now. I know yeah. that you're looking at possible permanent residency yeah. in Madrid. Yeah. Do you think about going back to Cuba? Do you think about, do, did you think that far in the future or is this, is, is where you are now a place? I mean, no, I, I considering, don't your, to considering your profession, I think, you know, Madrid is a, is a spectacular place to be, but do you yeah. think that far ahead in the future, whether one you want to go back? No, right now, everything can change always. But right now, I do not want to go back to Cuba at all. There are so many uh, places in the world that I want to be at and know and explore. And I, I, I'm just on a personal journey to, you know, gather as much experiences as I can and know as much, as much things as I can. And Cuba, I know it. I, I, I know it's Czech. Um, I miss my family, my, my dog and my mom and my dad a lot. Um, but it's, I, I'm honestly right now, I am not very interested in, uh, to, to be a part of whatever's going on there. Really. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Don't care. Really. <laughs> uh, not even, <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm no, just, it's yeah. again, yeah. again, I'm done with Cuba feeling right now, the most Cuban I felt ever. Right. So, right. I don't know. <laughs> conflicts. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think we should open it up to any any questions we may have and, and kind of take it from there. Yeah, great. We, we have one question that's come in from uh, Professor Bridget Murphy. She says, uh, Laura, are you in any of the photos and are any of your friends in the exhibition? I believe so. Yeah, there's yes. a photo. Of me <laughs> and yeah, friends. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, we got we have uh, Gabrielle. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Caitlin, I think you have that that picture of yeah. um, Gabby at the party. Let, I'll pull this up and uh, yeah, sure. Gabby, he's, Gabby he's with it. Smoking. It's a really yeah, cool pic. Yeah. It's not yeah. that cool in real life. <laughs> <laughs> you guys just bear with me for a second. I'm going to pull these up. Uh, yeah, so uh, while Caitlin's getting that up, I think it was, you know, meeting Laura and meeting her friends, um, we started to kind of I just kind of ran in the same social circles at that point. Um, we would hang out, we would go to different events and, and parties and, and different things. And there were a couple different um, youth groups that I was, I was kind of around with, but um, mainly, you know, Laura was helping me get into a lot of different places that um, were kind of, you know, unique and, and interesting. And so meeting a lot of her friends like Carmen and Gabrielle and, um, yeah. That's, that's Gabriel right there. Um, he's, you yeah, know, right here. Mm -hmm. it's, it just, it was just so fascinating to kind of just be a part of that. Like I, I always joke that it made me feel like I was in high school again, because it was like <laughs> trying to hang with the cool kids. Um, and it, and you know, for me, it was, it was just to be able to just exist in that space and kind of have these conversations. I, I just thought were so valuable and just, made the photography so much more meaningful. So yeah, you're gonna see, I mean, throughout here, there's a lot of people. There was another group that I connected with, um, a dance company called the Havana Queens. Um, Are they in the You can see showroom? some of that there. Yeah, they're, so a couple of those portraits uh, on, on, on white, um, Rachel is one of them in the red and black checkered shirt. You oh. have Pompey with his, with his custom made hat. Um, you know, this, this is part of the, uh, again, um, some different things that I found that Cubans could make their own money in, in dance troops or, um, you know, fashion blogging or whatever it might be. There were all kinds of different things that, that um, were new avenues to make money that wasn't the, I, I believe it, at the time it was $20 a month working for the government. Mm -hmm. And so instead, people were performing for 
tourist crowds. And, and, you know, one of the things about Havana Youth was that they weren't doing the salsa. They were doing hip hop, break dancing, different things that, you know, again, was kind of shedding the, the typical notion. Somebody goes to Cuba and thinks they're just going to see salsa and, and that's the experience. They want that traditional experience. And these, these uh, different dance troops were, were just saying, no, this is not, we, we're, we want to dance in contemporary. We want to do different things. And even, even the big club uh, slash art gallery that opened up that all the tourists and all the locals were, would frequent um, Fabrica de Arte. I mean, it's, it's a combination of dance club and uh, art exhibition. And so you really got that, that sense of, of different culture and, and, and that evolution that was happening. It wasn't the, the old typical Cuba. Yeah, Greg, uh, one of these photographs you mentioned, I think it's the dance battle here. Um, yeah. When we were, you know, just kind of discussing the concept behind it and how you came upon this. I mean, there are so many things here that sort of speak to me of the time. Like I, I love these two young women on their cell phones, you know, totally uninterested in <laughs> the dance battle that's <laughs> occurring. But you say um, that there was, there was no sort of, um, aggressive or combative spirit that accompanies. Yeah, I mean, we, we have movies here. Yeah, we have movies yeah. here that are, that are, you know, the, the, the dance battles are aggressive and, and, you know, it's, it's kind of a competition. And here it was two dance groups came together that, that, you know, rolled out a piece of linoleum in the middle of the street and said, hey, like, how about we do a dance battle? But it wasn't so much a battle as everyone just cheering each other on. And I thought that was... Right. You know something that that just spoke to that there was still this this collective understanding of each other that to be able to do this kind of thing was you know hasn't always been around it's fairly recent i, I kind of looked into the history of break dancing in cuba and yeah. it really had a resurgence once internet was around and people could watch youtube videos of of different breakdance moves and they would learn from that. I would go to some of the dance studios and, and see them watching those videos and then try and copy those moves. So it really kind of found a resurgence uh, once these restrictions were relaxed and internet was available again. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so interesting how the flow of information, you know, just totally um, feeds culture, right? So uh, fashion, um, dancing. Uh, one of the, the photographs that I, I just find so beautiful and interesting is this, it's a modeling school, right? Um, yeah. But there's, there's no electricity in the building. Right. It was an old theater that there wasn't any electricity and it ended up being um, a place that I, it was on my last day for one of my trips and just through a network of people had stumbled across and, you know, this modeling has become a very popular thing and mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's something that now, uh, I think more Cubans see as a way to make income by doing modeling and, and, and they see how successful it can be. Uh, Laura, you can, you were, I think you were there for this, but, um, didn't Chanel have a runway show at the, at the Prado in, wow. in Havana? Yeah. It was the, um, 2016 was kind of the year that, um, everything ex opened up, like exploded that year, Obama went to Cuba um, on March, that same month, the Rolling Stones did um, the free concert, which I, I think was, is incredible. And then um, um, Chanel did the, the runway at, at El Prado. It was almost like um, Havana all of a sudden became hip, like cool. Yeah. Um, it has changed since then. Like uh, people have passed uh, that, that um, excitement. We are, yeah, yeah. That, that, those were our mm. 50 minutes, yeah. It yeah. was interesting. Crazy. Wow. So, Greg, you were actually um, in in Cuba periodically between about 2014 and 2018, taking these Correct. photographs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I and I went back a couple times um, towards 2017, 2018 to do kind of a little update in terms of the technological aspect and and internet um, because that is is such a, a supreme interest. Um, to places outside of Cuba because it, it was something that, that was hard to come by. I mean, I remember talking to a couple of the DJs and, and they would 
you know, back when I first started going, they said it took 10 minutes to download one song. And yeah. we've even changed so much that, you know, music is streaming now. We don't download music anymore. It's just streaming. Yeah. So, you know, this is, pa this is Paula from the D DJ uh, group Pausa and, you know, they, they're sponsored. I still think, I think they're still sponsored by Red Bull and they go to Mexico all the time and they do big shows and big events. And, you know, it just, when I met them, it was right before all that started happening. They were kind of, you know, they had just been on the cover of the underground magazine. And so that just started putting them into a, a bigger place and a, a bigger, uh, a bigger place to, to have their music heard. And so now they're on, they're on Spotify, they're on Apple music. They're doing, you know, they're creating their own music. It's, you know, there's just so much stuff that when I feel like I was there, it felt like the cusp of all of this happening. And so it was kind of fun to just stay connected with everyone and, and, and see this, all of these talents like blossom, you know, and, and be finally seen on a world stage. Yeah, for sure. And Palza actually very kindly created a playlist for us um, whenever That's right. our Greg, your show was originally slated to open in March. And of course, because of the, the pandemic, we delayed it. But we kind of wanted to keep the spirit of your work alive and they put together this great playlist that kind of spanned historical Cuban music all the way to, you know, contemporary. Yeah. And I thought that was really fun. And that was something that, that, you know, when I, had, I had approached them about it, they, they were so on board to put that together because I think they saw like, you know, a, a bigger audience and it wasn't just about the sharing their own music, but it was sharing everyone else's as well. Yeah. We've got another question in the chat. Um, Greg, the lighting in the images is so striking. Did you have control with the lighting? How about the couple under the large tree? And Oh, yeah. No, no control. This is all natural light. Um, this is, I, I, you know, coming into Cuba, there were a lot of things. I got pulled out of the customs line twice um, by Cuban security officials who had my name and information before mm -hmm. I had entered the country. I had to sign an affidavit before going to Cuba um, about what my purpose was and I was never dishonest about it, but somehow that was getting through to Cuban officials. Um, and so twice I was pulled out of line and asked a bunch of questions about what I was doing there, what my purpose was. Um, and I think part of what helped was having minimal amount of gear. Um, it was a mm -hmm. small Sony camera, a couple of lenses, that could all fit on like a sling backpack that I could throw on. I wanted to be as uh, light as possible so that some days that I would walk eight miles or, or hang out for long periods of time. And, you know, I have this a small, I didn't want to have a big backpack on. I didn't want to be carrying so much gear or setting up lights and drawing more attention to myself. I wanted to be as, as, you know, non, non photographer as possible because I just kind of wanted to blend in. And that, that's to me seemed like the best way to do it. So I don't know. I mean, anytime you have a camera on you, it's going to stand out, but at least it wasn't like setting up lights or trying to uh, oppose people in, in that way. Right. That would have been a lot of gear to carry around. That's for sure. Yeah. So this is, this is on G street and um, they, they, they cut these, these hedges sculpturally, which is, which I always thought was fascinating. Um, but it's, it yeah. was another place where I found like, you know, there was a lot of different, and, and Laura, you can chime in on this too. Like there were a lot of like youth groups that hung out there with different, you had like the rock kids, you had, you know, all these different, like, you know, sub sections of, of what people's interests are all grouped in different little pockets of, of G street, which just kind of ran up and down, uh, one of the main crossing, one of the main thoroughfares in, in Havana. Yeah, G G Street from this the start of of the two thousands was kind of like the at, at every um, weekend on, on on weekends nights would be like the uh, the epicenter of the sub subcultural movement in Cuba, um, which was either you know like um, people who listen to rock and roll that later on shifted, but even the people who listen to rock and roll were like divided like subculturally like um, <laughs> the emos or uh, the people, you know, the really old ones. It was also a place where um, for a long time, there's there a lot of drugs, um, of course. Um, and then it was um, um, a place where around 2010, 2011, the government started coming in and started trying to dismantle because it would be like a thousand people on a Saturday night, just hanging out, most of them teenagers. 
um, and yes, yeah, just drinking and playing music and being anti, anti just system or whatever. Um, so it, it was a very, very interesting street. Right now, it's still like people still kind of maybe it's still happening, but not with the strength that it was happening. I mean, during 2007, 8, 9, 10, it was, it was crazy. Like, it was a very, very strong subcultural like movements there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's another thing I kind of wanted to show because of, we, we talked about the, the, this new, the, the youth aristocracy where it's, it's, there are the people who have money who can go to these clubs and pay the entry fee and go to places like Espacios or, mm -hmm. or wherever the new clubs are. And then there was the free version of that, which was Malacon or, yeah, exactly. you know, G Street. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's how you get the hierarchy. Like, um, there are some kids in some zones that can go to these like fancy clubs that right now I'd say the, the prices of the cocktails are the same as in many parts of the U.S. Like they're expensive places. Mm -hmm. And then you have, of course, the people that have um, lower income, like, whose family have lower income that would just, you know, have, go to uh, the Malecon and then play music there and drink there and hang out. It's, it's yeah, it's a very wild contrast. Um, when you see it from afar, but yeah. Oh. Um, we've got another question in. Um, how relevant is the Cuban diaspora of the same generation to shaping contemporary Cuban culture? From uh, Tristan Spinsky. Um, yeah, I would say so the, the strong, I, the, the, what's going on in the diaspora is um, culturally, I would say is what is, um, um, uh, like uh, shifting what's going on in Cuba. Like most, um, let me explain this because I think it's important that you understand that the, in Cuba, generationally, generationally, there are a lot of exodus, like people are exiting. Um, so the people that are maybe 30 something now, their exodus, their huge exodus was maybe um, 10 years ago. Right now, the, um, the, the people that are, exiting the country and that are moving mostly to the US or Europe um, are the people from my generation. Like I can confirm that um, the people that are like art historians and artists and so and so and so, um, um, graphic designers, all of, the, um, all of those people right now are either outside of Cuba, all of my friends are, are either out, outside of Cuba or trying to get outside of Cuba currently. So, um, um, I actually, while I was living in Barcelona, we had um, exhibitions there um, of uh, contemporary uh, Cuban photography. We're organizing all of these events from different diasporas, like from people that are in New York or from people that are in Madrid or in Miami. And we are um, like connecting and creating like cultural events from outside of Cuba. Um, also trying to get in like people that are inside of Cuba, but there's a lot going on. Like um, about a month ago, um, we created this um, um, festival, online festival called A Living Away that was that w the people that were organizing it um, were living in, in New York. But the people that were participating, most of them Cubans, but while it was an international um, festival, were from all over. Like uh, my girlfriend was the graphic designer of the festival and the people from Canada, from, um, from Germany. Right now, for example, in Ber Berlin, there's a huge diaspora of a lot of Cuban artists that have been also creating there. And I have, I have friends that are like, okay, so we're all going to Berlin like in, in August and then doing, doing things there um, and just collaborating as artists. So uh, it's, it's very, very strong. And uh, as I was saying, uh, many of these people weren't even my friends when I was in Cuba. But um, once I, ca I, I, I came out to Europe, it, it's like we have this sense of com camaraderie and this sense of just very, being very culturally active in the name of Cuba. So we have we've become really good friends and we're very, very active and doing a lot of things. I'm actually collaborating now with a, um, um, a magazine called Mujercitos. Oh. And the person that is um, leading the, um, the magazine is in, in Berlin. And, but many of the people that are writing for the uh, magazine are in La Havana. And then I'm collaborating from here. Some of the people are in New York. 
So as you, as, as you can tell, um, there's a, a, a lot happening in the diaspora. It's, it's very, very important, I would say, to what's, you know, Cuba is no longer Cuba. It's wherever we are. So, it's yeah. Global. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Oh, that's beautiful. I, I just want to note the time. We're at about um, 1258 here, Eastern Standard Time. And um, I, th I think that might be a great place to end our conversation, just that, you know, Cuban culture is rich in, um, you know, creation and con contributions to the world at large and artistically, culinarily, culturally. Um, and I, I'm so honored really to be able to show um, Greg's work and its highlighting of, of just the, the beautiful, beautiful um, Cuban culture. So you can see these photos in person here at Cody Gallery um, at Falston Center. It's 1000 um, North Glebe Road here in Arlington, Virginia. And the gallery is open uh, Thursday, Friday, 12 to 5 and Saturdays 1 to 4. Uh, we encourage you to come by. We've got a lot of hand sanitizer and masks for everybody who wants to come visit. Um, so Laura, thank you so much for joining us from Madrid and taking the time to, to speak thank with us about your background and culture. And um, Greg, thank you for creating this body of work. Thank you to everybody uh, for joining us from all of your very, various locations and to Dr. Becerra especially. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you thank for organizing you. and thank you for a wonderful session. Uh, thank you, Laura, for sharing your story. And I'm hoping to see the photography in person in the next few days. So thank you. Thank you, Greg. You're welcome. Thank you.